So people tend to not realize there's an outside to the Earth, and it's an interactive outside. We're not just floating in space, separated, you know, and nothing ever touches. Even a lot of nonlinear chaos freaky people that really are into that, they can't really get that there's an outside to the Earth. They know every self-organized system is extremely susceptible to even the slightest perturbations. They know that even really tiny inputs can have an effect, that any touch will start a ripple effect, much like dropping a stone in a, wa in a pond. But they're still shocked when they find out a chemical at 10 parts per trillion will change the sexual dynamics of male species across the entire planet. Okay. We are, however, embedded not only in Earth, but in universe. Just as eco-ranges are embedded within the larger Gaian system. The galaxy is, uh, the solar system is self-organized. The galaxy is self-organized. The universe is self-organized. There's a nested grouping of self-organized systems, just like there is here. The touch of the universe on the Earth is constant. And it creates constant alterations in system homeodynamics here. Right? And I love this. Even the study of ponds. This, these guys capture it perfectly. Even the study of ponds is affected by the universe. <laughs> and these guys say they're great. And their names, their names Pete and Briggs, but I think of it as Pete and Boggs. And they're always working out, you know, on the moors. I mean, he's the guy who was trapped from his last name, you know, in the beginning. But anyway, he says, any ultimate coordinating of events around the pond is made impossible by the fact that all systems are open to the rest of the universe. Even the movement of distant stars will produce minute changes in the gravitational field experienced on Earth. While these fluctuations will be beyond hope of any measurement on Earth, nevertheless, they will always destroy initial correlations. See, even the gravitational field of stars, they change things here, right? But most people don't think about it that way, especially scientists. We inhabit a planet that's not closed to the universe. It's touched every minute of every day by its surrounds, even if we cannot see the result of those touches. They continually alter the self-organized system that the Earth is in unpredictable ways. We are part of a scenario that's ongoing, that never stops, and in which humans only play a small part. This guy, Nigel Clark, I really love him. He's British. British scientist, he's fantastic. He says, the galaxies that exist in universe are immensely complex systems, constantly engaged in the circulation of energy and material with the interstellar medium that surrounds them. He understands that the supposedly empty space is a living field. Our own planet is only one participant in the vast and productive, self-organizing cycling of elements in one such galaxy. The Earth inheriting the organic elements necessary for its own self-organization from the greater system of which it is a small part. The Earth is not a tiny pebble of life alone in the void that surrounds it, but is rather a node with extensive interconnections to the rest of the galaxy and the universe itself. And this includes a great deal more than sunlight. Earth receives over 80 million pounds of extraterrestrial matter from the galaxy around it every year, 80 million pounds, composed of cosmic dust, meteorites, asteroids, and comets that break up in transit through the atmosphere. And a lot of that is organic molecules, and all of this affects the self-organized Earth system in ways nobody has studied. <coughs> Sometimes they're catastrophic, we've all heard of that the big dinosaur extinctions when the asteroid hit. But they're more often really subtle. We view such bombardments as random events, <laughs> random, right, as random events 
the shit happens view of life. <coughs> but emerging evidence is showing they are not random any more than the bacterial creation of rain is. I didn't talk about bio, bio precipitation, but bacteria <coughs> actually create rain. That's where it comes from, bacteria and fungi. There's an underlying order to these bombardments that is part of a much larger ecological function. <coughs> Astrophysicists have begun to notice a nonlinear periodicity to them. Some of them are being generated by chaotic outbursts in the orbits of Saturn and Jupiter. These outbursts trigger alterations in asteroid path and behavior so that they specifically intersect the orbit of Earth. Getting interesting. <laughs> These chaotic outbursts in the orbits of Saturn and Jupiter trigger alterations in asteroid path and behavior so that they specifically intersect the orbit of Earth. And while the larger events get all the attention, the smaller bombardments that continually occur are rarely noticed. They cause changes that have barely been glimpsed, that are usually overlooked. Virtually no one is asked what their function is. More pointedly, why is the Earth receiving directed inputs in the form of cosmic matter? There are millions of events like this going on all of the time continually which remain opaque to our vision and perception. We're ignorant of almost everything that goes on here. We don't see the important things, don't ask the crucial questions like what is the ecological function of the human species? Again, we don't exist independent of Earth. We're part of a larger system, not isolated bits thrown up through chance by a blind universe. And that system is very different than we've been taught. A lot of people see humans as a plague. But again, that assumes that Gaia is capable of a mistake of planetary proportions. But it's fundamental here that every species that emerges out of the ecological background only does so to fulfill specific functions. <coughs> every species we see is an innovation of less complex bacterial forms. And the human fulfills multiple ecological functions the same as any large predator. By the way, we are predators. Okay. We are predators. All of you have experienced that once or twice, I'm sure. So we fulfill the same ecological functions as any large predator. They're very complex. And also, every large species on the planet serves to spread the seeds of plants to new locations. There's a reason why a lot of plants have little hooks on their seeds. So fur-bearing animals can act as their spreaders. A deeper look at plants for me always generates the question, are we only a domesticated species serving primarily as a <laughs> mechanism for plant propagation? <laughs> and if you look at it, like a lot of people are going, oh, the British went all around the world and they took all these plants and they took over the whole world. And the British went home, but their plants are still here. They're messing up everything. You know? But it's like if you look at it that we are designed as domesticated animals for plant propagation, the whole picture changes. <laughs> <laughs> I sit around and think stuff like this all the time. <laughs> so, what ecological function is the human species fulfilling through the processing of so much ecological capital through the generation of technology? It's an odd thing that the human species has been so powerfully driven to go outward and upward. They can't seem to stop themselves, you know. There's a drive deep in the organism, so driven are we that we've even traveled into space. There's speculation among some that life arose on Earth 
because bacteria from out there impacted this planet in the distant past. Okay. Of course, but that also drives reductionist crazy because then they go, but where did it start? <laughs> you know, they keep trying to find some beginning. Of course, there isn't one. Life is inherent in the scenario, okay? Just like gravity is. It drives them nuts. Because they assume there was a time when there was no life. <laughs> Isn't that a weird thing? But if you get that life is inherent in the scenario that we're embedded in, it changes everything. But that kind of messes up their thinking. They get very uncomfortable. And they go home and have arguments with their spouse. <laughs> Lynn Margolis did find that all life forms that we know came from four early bacterial types millions of years ago. Over long timelines, those four combined through symbiogenesis to create complex organisms. Life began here with a few simple bacteria. So people think maybe those bacteria were sent through space and initiated life over long eons of time. It is unlikely if we will ever know if that's what happened. But there's one thing we absolutely do know, all right, and it's that bacteria from here are going out there. Okay. Our space probes are filled with bacteria. Okay. No matter what they do to try to keep them out, they're filled with bacteria. Okay. And we're sending, and, and viruses and fungal spores as well, we're sending our probes to every planet in the solar system and even farther out. Lewis Thomas comments that the Earth is entering the first stages of replication, scattering seeds of itself, perhaps in the form of microorganisms similar to those dominating the plants, the planet's own first life for the first two billion years. Just as pollen, bacteria, viruses, and fungal spores travel into the great spaces around them through complex, usually invisible mechanisms. We travel into the great spaces outside us, carrying all of those original bacteria with us to inseminate planets everywhere. PowerPoint. <laughs> a little further, there we go. That's a picture of Sputnik, the very first space probe. That's an E. coli. <laughs> the thing is, what's fascinating is that, you know, I love what James Hillman said. We didn't invent anything. Everything that we do is based on forms already here, whether we know it or not. And now the space probes we're sending out are more complicated. I don't have a picture of it, but actually what they are, they're a perfect blend of a plant and a microbe. A lot of the things we send out look like fungal spores, right? Or they look like bacteria. And, but then they've got these leaves attached to them that work with sunlight. Really fascinating. So what's fascinating is, too, is that so, you know, Sputnik was kind of simplistic, but then we thought, yes, let's make the moon lander. Okay, so moon lander, there it is. Ooh, that's so much more complicated. Surely we've progressed beyond bacterial forms. PowerPoint, that's a virus. <laughs> 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 Pretty astonishing, huh? Wow. These patterns, it's in a way, it's like what Jung talked about with the collective unconscious. These patterns are there. We don't even know what we're mimicking. And the thing is about viruses and E. coli, they travel through tremendous distances to get from one place to the other, just like our probes going through space. And as those organisms take life to new locations when they travel, so do we. Bacteria, viruses, and pollen rise up on thermal currents and travel tremendous distances to spread. And we're sending bacterial and microbial organisms deep into space on thermal currents as well. To other planets, to other solar systems where they can take root, where Gaia can reproduce. 
And Buckminster Fuller said this many years ago, we're like bees, you see. Bees who go out looking for honey without realizing that we're performing cross-pollination. We're like bees, you see. Bees who go out looking for honey without realizing we're performing cross-pollination. How do you say that? Pollen, pollination, I guess. Pollination. Pollinization. <laughs> Is it pollinization or pollination? Really? Okay, I think pollination wins. But uh, pollinization, there's something cool about that word. I, I knew this woman that you'd, she would say the word rotisserie. You know the word rotisserie? She would go, rotisserieary. <laughs> Which makes perfect sense, you know, when you think about it. Steven, pollinization is pollinization in French. That's how we say it. Really? Yeah. Oh, excellent. <laughs> so, microbes are tremendously hardy. They survive in space quite well. Right? Now, it's, it's fascinating. Right after I did this book and I sent it in, it came out, I was seeing something every week in the news, like the things I'm going to read now. It's astonishing. Okay? But it's like, here's a NASA bulletin. For, human, for a human, unprotected space travel is a short trip measured in seconds. Right? Unprotected space travel is a trip measured in seconds. But for some kinds of microbes, the harshness of space travel is not unlike their everyday stressful existence. The successful execution of ingenious survival tricks learned over billions of years of earthbound evolution. There were, it seems, inadvertent stowaways during the pre-Apollo missions to the moon. Streptococcus mitis. The only known survivor, as NASA put it, of unprotected space travel. <laughs> the organism survived launch, space vacuum, three years of radiation exposure, deep freeze at an average temperature of 20 degrees above absolute zero, no nutrients, water, or energy source. They were sent to the moon, breathed, or touched onto equipment by technicians with one of the surveyor probes that preceded the Apollo mission. Only one of the probes was ever visited by humans during the Apollo 12 lunar mission. Pete Conrad, the mission commander, said, I always thought the most significant thing we ever found on the whole moon was that little bacteria who came back and lived and nobody ever said anything about it. <laughs> they gathered it up, brought it back, and it immediately came alive. Bacteria can survive these kinds of conditions for millions of years. The oldest that people know of survived 25 million years of encapsulation in the intestinal tract of a resin-trapped bee. It took somewhere between 500 million and 1 billion years for bacterial life to spread on this planet. Life takes its time. Gaian seeding has begun, though it may take 500 million years or more before the birth of Gaian offspring. Still, this is not the first time Gaia has sent her seeds beyond the boundaries of the planet, and it won't be the last. We are, after all, only passing actors on the stage. Tremendous volcanic explosions throw them out into space, too. Powerful meteor impacts do the same thing. The Krakatoa explosion was strong enough to throw earth matter filled with microbes up into space, where they would float on the cosmic winds, much as pollen grains do on the Earth's winds until they're caught by the gravitational field of another planet. Recently, I don't know if anybody saw this, <laughs> they, they discovered plankton growing on the outside windows of the space station. <laughs> They're like, a, you know, what the hell is going on here? And the Mars um, um, explorer that's up there now, they thought they'd done it completely sterilely, but they discovered that there were over 335 different microorganisms on that, 35 of which can survive the Martian conditions. And they go into kind of a hibernation, but then they start to learn to adapt. 
and they begin to change the environment of the place to make it habitable for them. They create life, right? They create guy in life. So, is the nonlinear periodicity of asteroid impacts on Earth specifically connected to this Gaian seeding of the galaxy, the wind pollination of the universe? Gaia always innovates on earlier forms. Wind pollination gave way to pollinator pollination. It's much more efficient for the pollen to be taken exactly where it needs to go. I mean, we just think we're exploring the universe, but actually what we're doing is we have all of these things that we're making based on microbial forms that we're taking to moons, planets, the solar system, other galaxies, other universes. We inevitably think it's all about us, not realizing, in fact, that we're just pollinators. And you know, it's fascinating. The whole world was incredibly excited about the moon missions going into space. Everybody watched it everywhere. They're completely excited. And after about 10 years, nobody cared anymore. It's fascinating. I mean, there's still some geeks that get into it, but most people just don't care. The thing is, we fulfilled our ecological function. Plants in the fall begin to set seed. They begin to, they use their stored nutrients to create seeds and send them into the world so that the species can spread, and they all begin to look a bit ragged after that. <laughs> they use their stored resources to create seeds, to go out into the vast spaces around them. Then they go into the long winter to regenerate, and in spring they begin the cycle once again. So it's not surprising the earth is beginning to look a bit ragged. Not surprising so many stored resources have been used up in the creation of a technology that has served primarily to send Gaian seeds to other planets. <laughs> and it's not surprising that we are reaching peak oil, peak topsoil, peak water, peak bacterial resistance, peak everything within a 50 year period of time. Just as the bacterial seeds have been sent out, given the length of geologic timelines for every indicator to be reaching peak within that small time slot is basically simultaneous. It's beyond coincidence. What is at risk from our human point of view is not the planet, but our civilization. I mean, everybody's, we have to save the planet. Look, the planet has dealt with a lot worse shit than this in its past, okay? And it's really, the human species as well is gonna be fine. Our civilization is not, it's not very adaptable. It's dependent on resource extraction, a resource extraction that cannot be maintained. We have already exceeded the carrying capacity of the Earth. We're burning the house. At this point, we are burning the house to keep warm in the winter. Okay? Now, normally, we lived on ecological interest. Now we're using ecological capital. Okay? And England is the perfect place to use that as a metaphor, especially Darnington Hall, because the people here that own this place back in the 1800s, they're incredibly rich, right? But they used, up, they used up the interest, then they used up the capital, and then there was nothing left but to get drunk and let the place deteriorate, and then they sold it. <laughs> and you know, that's the reason alcohol was invented. So when things fall apart, you know, at the very least we can drink. See, the African story of Pandora's box was much more interesting. They didn't have hope in there. I mean, what a stupid thing to have in there. They had beer. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're a much an older civilization, very practical people. We're in a time of shifting paradigms when one form gives way to another, and our civilization in this form is unlikely to survive but we will. I mean, I don't know why everybody's so hung up on all this stuff. It's, 
everybody has some kind of weird belief, you know, that prior to 1946, human beings, well, they were lucky to live to be 26 years old. They had no <laughs> teeth. They were ill all the time. And they worked really, really, really hard. <laughs> the thing is, the Kalahari, who live in one of the most difficult ecosystems on Earth, of all of the hunter-gatherer tribes, they only work 15 hours a week. <laughs> so who's the primitive savage and who is it? <laughs> you know, most of the time, indigenous tribes spent their life in what we would call leisure pursuits. Whether automobiles exist or not, whether skyscrapers exist or not, whether physicists exist or not, <laughs> humans will still have full lives. Our ancestors did not live diminished lives just because they didn't know of PhDs, our cappuccinos, our airplanes, our Mozart, our nonlinearity. And there's all kinds of patterns that are going on all of the time that we just don't perceive. And I've mentioned one of them as antibiotic resistance gets closer and closer to its ultimate conclusion of pharmaceuticals not working anymore. At the same time, there's hundreds of thousands of herbalists training just because they think they should, right? They're disguised as housewives and carpenters, <laughs> retail clerks, you know, taxi drivers, bartenders and gardeners. And they, all of them, for the most part, just say, we don't know why we're doing this, we just feel like we have to. As Rilke once put it, all will come again into its strength. The fields undivided, the waters undammed, the trees towering and the walls built low, and in the valleys people as strong and as varied as the land and no churches where God is imprisoned and lamented like a trapped and wounded animal. Yeah. And no churches where God is imprisoned and lamented like a trapped and wounded animal. The houses welcoming all who knock and a sense of boundless offering in all relations and in you and me. No yearning for an afterlife. No looking beyond, no belittling of death, but only longing for what belongs to us and serving the earth, lest we remain unused. And serving the earth, lest we remain unused. <laughs> and serving the earth, lest we remain unused. Isn't that wonderful? I love that. Making our way through this transition is dependent on one thing, and that is you following your own inherent genius. <coughs> it's interesting. You know how I got to this thing about the ecological function of the human species? It took, oh, 20 years of thinking and work about it, and it came from Lynn Margolis's work. And it was funny. I spoke at Amherst on a panel with her and so somebody brought up, you know, this, and I answered it really briefly, and she turns to me and she goes, how did you come up with that? And I said, well, Lynn, it's inherent in your work. And she goes, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one was Richard Dawkins. Love picking on him. It's like, he's such a big target. He's so slow moving. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> He said to Jim Lovelock once, he goes, Gaia's not alive because Gaia doesn't reproduce. Oh my God. And I thought, well, that's what I got to be one of the stupidest things I ever heard anybody say. I mean, he's going to live, what, 80, 85 years, and he's pronouncing this statement. He's making this definitive statement about an organism that's 4 billion years old. How would he know? I mean, think about it. If there's something that the Earth only does once every million years or 10 million years, how are we going to know? Okay. And the third one was that Buckminster Fuller saying, we're like bees, you see. Everybody thinks it's a metaphor, but he actually was really clear it wasn't. Gaia sends impulses through the system. 
The subunits respond to that impulse. They generate possible behavioral responses. Then they choose from among them. Gaia trusts the inherent genius of all of her subunits. Okay? Gaia trusts you. Gaia trusts you. Gaia trusts you. Following your own inherent genius, however, means becoming barbarian. <laughs> that is, someone not civilized. Civilized comes from a Latin root. It, mean, it comes from the word civil, meaning of or pertaining to citizens. Citizen means of the cities. Okay. To be civilized means to become of the cities. Originally, it just meant a New Yorker or a Londoner or somebody from Rome. Okay. The Oxford English Dictionary <laughs> defines it as to bring out of a state of barbarism, <laughs> to instruct in the arts of life. <laughs> and thus to elevate on the scale of humanity. See, the evolutionary escalator is there again, to elevate on the scale of humanity. <laughs> the modern definition emerges out of social Darwinism, which is an inescapable element of neo-Darwinist paradigm. It views culture along a range of development similar to that of species. In other words, we rose from the slime. You know, and by dint of our opposable thumbs and our forebrain, we rose from the slime and step by step, we lived first as dirty savages in caves, afraid of lions and stuff. <laughs> then roved in hunter-gatherer groups, hardly ever washing or anything. <laughs> And finally, we discovered agriculture. We began to develop cities, writing, big pens, no more quill sharpening, multi-syllable words, printing presses, gossip columnists, antibiotics, airplanes, axis of evil, alliteration, and <laughs> PhD degrees to elevate on the scale of humanity. Now, barbarian has a Greek root. Oh, do the PowerPoint one more time, just for fun. Thanks. I love that picture. Barbarian has a Greek root. It means unintelligible speech. Unintelligible speech. It simply meant them rather than us, an outsider, somebody that doesn't talk like us. Okay. You're not from around these parts, are you? <laughs> uh, so it came to mean somebody who doesn't act like us. The word barb also means beard, an unshaven state. Barber deals with beard. So, you know, not only somebody that talks funny, but hairy as well. <laughs> <laughs> and barbarian, you know, had a similar meaning. It, you know, it just, it came over time like, uh, it, to mean somebody not of Rome, somebody not sophisticated. But when the Christians took over, it came to mean a heathen, a pagan, someone not of the Christian faith. To the Christians, Romans were barbarians, kind of a what goes around comes around kind of deal. <laughs> Payback is a bitch. <laughs> Barbarian means someone not of the cities, someone with wildness inside them, someone unshaven, someone whose speech is unintelligible, a pagan. Now pagan, to continue with this whole thing, is a really interesting word. It came into use once Christianity had control of the Roman cities, and it means villager or rustic. Basically, all it meant was the people and the outlying villages and towns still had the old religion. Heathen is similar. It means a person of the heath. 
Heath means uncultivated land, wilderness. Heathen is someone of the wilderness, not of the cities, someone with wildness inside them. The earth, by definition, is not of the cities. You understand what I mean? Gaia is wilderness. Gaia is the earth ecosystem functioning with its wildness intact. When this work is taken up, when you begin shifting your perception as a way of life, when you begin a different way of thinking, a Gaian way of thinking, by definition you begin to become not of the city. A certain wildness begins to re-enter the self, speech begins to change, a deep connection with the sacredness and intelligence of the earth begins, pagan sensibilities recur. John Seeds shared this great metaphor once, he said, when we go inside of ourselves, when we begin to remove the introduced beliefs one by one by one, of their own accord, old ways of thought begin to emerge again. <coughs> you begin to become of the heath, wild once more. This work changes those who do it. There is no escaping that. The more you change, the more your speech will become unintelligible to those of the cities. <laughs> and a number of people have mentioned that to me over this week, like, well, when I go out, how do I talk about this stuff? Right? Your speech will become unintelligible to those in the cities, to those who have advanced degrees. <laughs> You'll begin speaking of things that those in cities cannot, by definition, understand. You will begin to know, as Goethe put it, the inmo innermost weave of the world to witness its dynamics and creation. To know the innermost weave of the world to witness its dynamics and creation. To re-inhabit your interbeing with the world. Or as I sometimes say it, once your life has been saved, by a plant, nothing is ever the same again. Once this occurs, you begin to follow golden threads that lead you into unique behaviors, unique responses to the difficulties of our times. These behaviors are expressed out of your unique genius and purpose. Now, Buckminster Fuller talked about it like this. He said, in 1979, he said, it is my driving conviction that all of humanity is in peril of extinction if each one of us does not dare now and henceforth always to tell only the truth and all of the truth and to do so promptly right now. Okay. It is my driving conviction that all of humanity is in peril of extinction if each one of us does not dare now and henceforth always to tell only the truth and all of the truth and to do so promptly right now. <laughs> he said, I'm convinced that humanity's fitness for continuance in the cosmic scheme no longer depends on the validity of political, religious, economic, or social organizations which altogether heretofore have been assumed to represent the many. Because contrary to that, I'm convinced that human continuance now depends entirely upon the intuitive wisdom of each and every individual. The individual's comprehensive informedness, the individual's integrity of speaking and acting only on the individual's own within self-intuited and reasoned initiative the individuals joining action with others as motivated only by the individually conceived consequences of doing so. The individuals never joining action with others as motivated only by crowd-engendered emotionalism or by a sense of the crowd's power to overwhelm or in fear of holding to the course indicated by one's own intellectual convictions. Bucky understood that the systems that are in place are creations of the old thinking, the old paradigm. He understood 
such systems need to be abandoned because they can never prepare us for the future we now face, nor respond to the demands of our time. <laughs> I think this is hilarious. Anna Freud in 1968, she said, when we scrutinize the personalities who by self-selection became the first generation of psychoanalysts, we are left with no doubt about their characteristics. They were the unconventional ones, the doubters, those who were dissatisfied with the limitations imposed on knowledge. Also among them were the odd ones, the dreamers, those who knew suffering from their own experience. This type of intake has altered decisively since psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic training has become institutionalized and appeals in this stricter form to a different type of personality. Self-selection has given way to the careful scrutiny of applicants, resulting in exclusion of the eccentrics, the self-made, those with excessive flights of imagination, we now favor the acceptance of the sober, well-prepared ones. Eek. It's, under, it's important to understand that the sober, well-prepared ones are not equipped constitutionally to deal with nonlinearity. As Paul Krugman once put it, he said, experience has made it painfully clear that men in suits not only don't have any monopoly on wisdom, they have very little wisdom to offer. <laughs> the writer Jenny Diskey captures some of this of what is at the core of the sober ones when she says, they were the ones who never thought to doubt that everything they knew and thought was right and good and normal. That whatever they did not know or had not heard of was subversive and dangerous and who had moral rectitude stamped like Blackpool rock through their unbending <laughs> spines from caucus to brainstem. <laughs> there was the same quivering, tight-lipped prissiness, the untroubled moral righteousness, the desire for the respectable and normal so powerful that it governed every movement of their life. The writer and psychologist Adam Phillips reaches deeper into this absurdity when he says, this is really great, psychoanalysts after Freud have to acknowledge that the founder of psychoanalysis was never properly trained. <laughs> and there was no one to tell him whether what he was doing with his patients was appropriate. That Freud was the first wild analyst is one of the difficult facts in the history of psychoanalysis. It is easy to forget that in what is still its most creative period between 1893 and 1939, when Freud, Jung, Klein, everybody were learning what they thought of as the new science, they had no formal training. Later generations of analysts deal with their envy of Freud and his early followers by making their trainings increasingly rigorous by demanding and fostering the kind of compliance that tends to stifle originality. Psychoanalytic training has become a symptom from which a lot of people never recover. Okay. We need the eccentrics. We need the dreamers. That's what Schumacher is all about. The eccentrics the dreamers, the odd ones, the unconventional ones, the self-selected, those who are dissatisfied with the limitations imposed on knowledge. They are the ones who can find solutions that the existing systems cannot. Every major innovation I know of has come from outside the conventional realm. Bill Mollison in permaculture, Jim Lovelock was an independent scientist and scholar. Okay. He had an economic stability in a way. He wasn't dependent on the outside. Okay. And so, you know, and I shared that thing about 
how the gaming community, the people on the internet solved how that protein folded. There's another one that I talked about too, some 13-year-old kid in school, one of his math teachers happened to mention this math problem that, that mathematicians had not been able to solve for 300 years. He solved it over the weekend. <laughs> and, and when, you know, then he didn't realize it was such a big deal until he turned in the solution. And then he said, oh, the only reason I did it is because uh, nobody told me I couldn't. Another story I really like, there was this, it's an old story about a, and I don't remember the names of the people, but there was this little kid in Nebraska back in the 1800s, late 1800s, and there used to be these traveling circuses and stuff that would come through, and there was this magician came through, and he was doing all these amazing tricks, and the kid just gets enamored of it. You know, he just, he goes, this is it, this is what I want to do. So he spent years and years training himself to be a magician, reading what books he could find, but he practiced the tricks that the guy had done over and over and over and over again. He had this one thing about the disappearing coin trick, and the kid practiced it, practiced it, he goes, man, hey, this was really hard. This is the hardest of all of them. And he practiced it, took him like 10 years to figure it out. So years later, he's a really well-known magician. He happens to run into this other guy in New York. And he says, tells him the story. He goes, oh, you know, you influenced my whole life. This is magnificent. You know, and it was the disappearing coin trick. That was the hardest one. I don't, I don't know how you did that. It took me 10 years to figure it out to do it. And the guy says, well, show it to me. And the guy does it. And the guy goes, do, the, do that again. And he does it again. He goes, Nobody does it that way because that's impossible. <laughs> and he says, here's how I do it. And the guy goes, eh. <laughs> and so I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote, a remote important region in all who talk. Though we could fool each other, we should consider, lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake. Our breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals we give, yes, our no, our maybe, should be clear. The darkness around us is deep. I believe in all of your all's inherent genius. The most sustainable patterns are the ones that Gaia herself uses. An impulse comes into the system, all of the self-organized intelligent subparts begin to work on it and they generate solutions out of their own genius that then is put back into the system. Right? And then it begins to spread. And you never know how it's going to work out. You just never know. You do it because there's joy in it. And I remember somebody asked Jacques Cousteau this question once. He was talking about how he'd gone back to the Mediterranean after <laughs> years and years and years, and he went diving, and it was a desert. Everything was dead. And so he began working on behalf of the oceans. So there is this, it was an inter television interview, and then the interviewer looks at him and goes, well, you've been working at this for a long time. Do you think you're going to win? And he, he looked at her in shock. He goes, what kind of a question is that? One doesn't do it because one expects to win. One does it because one must. And it's the thing Gandhi said, the step and the destination are the same thing. In the West, we're so hung up on getting to the, the goal, to the end point, we don't realize the step is the destination. If you put each foot carefully in the luminous world, and the next step carefully, if each step is congruent with who you are and what you're doing, you're already at the destination. The end result is already coming into being in that moment. And the more you walk, the more inertia there is, the more motive force builds up, and then it just sort of pops into being at this certain point. But the whole time, you've already been in the destination with each step you've taken. Beginnings are delicate times. It's why it's extremely important to make sure that each step you take is the right step. Many of us begin with what is a wrong step. Okay? We do something because somebody convinces us we should. 
some voice in our head is telling us, oh, you must be an organic gardener. That's the way to save the planet. Oh, you must do this. Oh, you must do that. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't eat meat, don't do this, <laughs> don't do that. Avoid elevators, eat only elk. <laughs> And so we start, we have all these voices telling us what to do, but inside each of us there's this still, small center of ourselves in the core of us. And all you do is, here look, you think about something you're going to do and you ask yourself, how does it feel? Right? Look, if any of us had had the choice, the first day of school, we'd walk in, we'd ask ourselves, <laughs> how does it feel? And we would go as fast as we could the other way. <laughs> right? The doctor gives us a pill. We ask ourselves, how does it feel? And we go, not sure I want to take that. Right? The really great thing to do is to get a pharmaceutical, an antibiotic is especially nice for this. Okay? Get an antibiotic and sit with it and go, how does it feel? And do like that exercise with, that you did with the plant. You write down everything that comes. Ask your child, write down everything, and then go sit with the plant and compare the difference. Okay. So we're convinced. I mean, sometimes pharmaceuticals are useful, but not very often. There's a very few people I know that need them all the time. There are some. But... Most of us know when we're given that. But most people have a hesitation about taking those things. But the voice in our head says, oh, you must do this because it's good for you. Right? And then we take it and our whole GI tract is going, no, no, don't do it. <laughs> so I have a friend of mine who has cystic fibrosis. I mentioned him before. And, you know, it took a long time for me to convince him to begin using plants and to do other things. Right? And so he created eventually a little altar and he puts his pharmaceuticals on the altar and he prays with them every day and they come more alive. It's a reason why he's the third oldest cystic fibrosis person in the United States now. Right? Because he did all this other stuff. An interesting thing, he and his doctor wrote an article on because most cystic fibrosis patients use other stuff. They just don't tell their doctors. Right? They either use prayer, or they use plants, or they use all kinds of things. Reflexology, acupuncture. So he and his doctor wrote an article. And this guy, Ed, I mean, he's like a phenomenal, you know, he's a really world-respected scholar, amazingly intelligent. And so is his physician. And so they wrote an article on that cystic fibrosis patients are using all these other things, just not to prove that they were better, but just so the doctors would know, right? And it was accepted by the Journal of the American Medical Association for publication until the senior editor returned from vacation. <laughs> and he said, nothing like this will ever be printed in this magazine, in this journal, right? And Ed was shocked. And I was like, what world have you been living in, man? This is the way that it is. Why? Why what? Why is it like that? Because it contradicts their paradigm. Okay. And so the thing is to trust that genius in you, and you'll come up with solutions to things that will just blow my mind, blow all of our minds. That's the way it works. Mm -hmm. So I really encourage you to follow that. So, actually, that went, took a lot less time than I thought. I thought it would go on and on and on. <laughs> so, questions? Yes? Uh, you said Gaia trusts you. You said it three, four times, and you said it yesterday. Yeah. And I, it's kind of disturbed me a little, in that it seems Good. very similar to God trusts me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like there's a separation. Uh -huh. For me, it's like, aren't I Gaia? I mean, if Gaia over there trusts me. Right, yeah, you know, I know, what, I know what you're saying, but most people spend a lot of their time feeling kind of alone, you know, or lost, or struggling. So that need of separation. So it's always nice to hear that your mother cares about you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, it's okay, I can do that. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. You said that um, we are basically eat everything. Yes. And uh, and um, but the earth will survive. Yes. Humanity will survive. Yes. Civilization will go. Right. Is there any problem with civilization going? I don't think I don't think so. I mean, Jim Lovelock. See, the thing is, I love books. Yeah. I love writing. I love all the marvelous things people have discovered. I mean, we've we've done so many wonderful things as well as so many horrible things, right? And Jim Lovelock is looking at the end of civilization. He's quite clear. He knows. That's why he's saying, well, we must have nuclear power because, in a way, it's the only thing that can sort of create islands of civilization that can endure the long, slow collapse. But, you know, of course I grieve it. I think it's wonderful stuff. But it's like memory, the memory of it all will remain in the people that come after. I mean, just as the memory of all of the great civilizations remain still that have passed before. Anyway, that's what I think. Yes, Stefan? Do you think then we should be creating uh, spaceships that are full of bacteria flinging them out to space, into space deliberately? We are, we are already. <laughs> no, 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 we don't need to put the bacteria out. No, but we do it anyway. But see, I see what you're saying. Do we do it deliberately? Well, I see what you're saying, but that, that would be so far beyond, that would be an altruistic act, so far beyond what we could conceive of, that we're like accepting that the primary life form on Earth is, is microbial, and we just fill our things with this and send them out all over the place, and this altruistic act is Gaia's pollinators loving the Earth and doing this stuff. And if you were in charge of NASA, that would be the truth. <laughs> <laughs> You do this to your friends often, don't you? <laughs> You're getting even with me for making you smile that way. I know it. That's what it is. Actually, actually, my approach would be quite different. Because it's already been done, and Gaia takes a long time. I mean, we're looking at 500 million years, maybe, for this, the seeding to take root. I'm much more of a simple person in that way. I would be looking at creating places like Schumacher all over the world. And I would be looking at sustainable, creating more simple, sustainable things. I mean, I get great joy in the working with my hands and being an artisan. And one of the problems I've continually run into in the States is the building codes and the inspectors and all of that, a lot of the things that are most sustainable are illegal. So you have to fight and, or sneak or do all of this stuff. But I mean, I love, I see, here's another thing I think is wonderful. Look, there's all these things happening. So in England, there's not a lot of land. And what there is is expensive, right? So there's a lot of younger people, which you all have, I'm sure, heard about, that are going out into the forests and using limbs that have fallen down to make these most marvelous structures. Have you seen pictures of them? Oh, they're the most marvelous things. You look, have you seen them, the pictures? They're absolutely marvelous. They look like little hobbit homes. You know, and they've spent maybe a few thousand pounds at most making these things. Yeah, those are the circle things. And, you know, they're old traditional styles of, but they're not waiting around. They're not going, yes, I must work for 20 years, save the money, then get permission from the planning commission to do this. They're just going, screw that, and they're going out and do that. Others of them in Spain, a lot of these small villages in the towns have been abandoned, right? Nobody's there. So they're just going up and living in them and re reclaiming the town and building it all up again in these marvelous villages miles from anywhere. That's the kind of stuff I love, this very simple relationship to things and learning how to work with local materials. Like another thing, you know, and there's, it's just a different kind of thinking like, there's a story I read recently, and I think it might have been about Oxford University, one of the colleges there, but I don't remember for sure. But it was over here someplace. And so, you know, they had these, like in the Great Hall, they had those huge, the arches up there. There was some building with this massively huge arch, and it was failing. And so the carpenters were called in, and they're like, they measure everything, and they're getting, figuring out what kind of piece of wood they need and they go, well, we don't really know where we're going to get that because there isn't any wood that size that we can get anywhere. 
and they're like really, you know, trying to figure it out. They have all the plans. They don't know where to get it. And one of the gardeners tends to walk in, or and walked in then about that time and said, "Oh, I've heard that you're replacing one of the whatever they're called." Bees. And be <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the ribs or it it's. I think it was King's College, Cambridge. Okay, that could have been. And so. And so he walks in and he goes, oh, he goes, you know, just to let you know, the tree that we've been saving for that for the last 500 years is now ready to be <laughs> harvested. <laughs> because it takes about that long for them to get to the right size. And nobody else had really remembered it but the gardeners, because they passed the knowledge down through generations. Or like another story that I told in my first book, Sacred Plant Medicine, which was uh, in Korea, there was a time, a very long time ago, where the ginkgo tree was in danger of extinction. And so the abbots of the Buddhist monasteries, they sent the young monks out looking for saplings. And one was brought back to this particular monastery and it's been growing there for a thousand years. The monks pray with it every day. Isn't that marvelous? It's like, that's the kind of stuff that excites me, right? But in the United States, it's quite different. The oldest bristlecone pine was discovered by this guy. He was doing research on it, and he had a, a core. He was going to take a core sample of the tree and count the rings. but his core wasn't working, but he did have a saw. Oh. And he cut it down and counted the rings, and it was 5,000 years old. Oh. See, the impact of that, there's no PhD thesis worth that to me, right? But you feel the impact of that stupidity. But just think the difference when the gardener works with a tree for 500 years, saving it for one of those ribs. Or they pray for 1,000 years with the ginkgo tree in the Sangaman, <laughs> I can't remember the name, temple in Korea, right? So. Um, you've been bringing our attention to the shift of paradigms and <clears throat> the trust into the unique individual genius right. and for each person to take that initiative. And I just want to support that, I think, and share with everybody a message that came very strongly from the film that was already mentioned by, by the Kogi tribe. And one of their messages and the reason I wanted to share it with everybody is because it's been coming very strongly to me from plants as well. And the quote <laughs> tell us that we have ears so that we can think. Listening is thinking. And to me, that ties very well with what you were saying about not doing the same thing, but more of it. Right. So the kind of thinking that we've been engaged in with, we have to undo. And the kind of thinking we have to engage with is the listening. Um, there is a beautiful um, human being called Adya Shanti, and he also supports this message by saying, if you want to know something, go elsewhere. If you want to unknow everything, then sit and listen. And I think this is essential. I think it's important. That's why I love that statement, the first act of disobedience is contemplation. Because in contemplation, we listen. Doing something different means doing something different. Thinking differently means thinking differently. Right? 
I mean, it seems obvious, but it's... <laughs> no. So I just want to say, so we're winding down. You, you all have been absolutely wonderful for my last teaching workshop. I really appreciate it quite a lot, that you've held the space for me as I've held the space for you. You've brought such wonderful stuff and such wonderful memories for me to have about my last teaching workshop of this kind of form. And you've just been great. I mean, you went so deep into the exercises, too. It was just marvelous to see. I really appreciate that. And all of the gifts you brought and the things that you've shared and everything has been really wonderful for me. So thank you for making it a really good time. And uh, I mean, I've been in workshops over the years where um, there might be a few unkind people in the workshop who the whole workshop gets all stirred up and it becomes a huge mess and everything. And I really appreciate that that did not happen because I wanted to leave with the best possible memories. And you all have just been wonderful that when brain wobbles occurred, you dealt with them responsibly. <laughs> <laughs> And especially, and it's like hilarious, because I said that thing, there's no such thing as a bad food. And it was really great. It really did set about eight or ten of you off. You were just quivering. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, you know, and you were like, ah, but, 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 and, but you, did, you dealt with it so well. Thank you. Yes. Stephen, can we do a follow-up retreat? <laughs> can you do a follow-up <laughs> retreat? Um, nice try. Nice try. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. Um, I just wanted to say that the way you use your hands when you speak is very much like the picture behind you. Ah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what a nice thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, thank you for being here. Thank and you. Putting science in a poetic way. You're um, welcome. Even a non scientist like me can understand it. Well. <laughs> You come from a very poetic culture. <laughs> a lot of deep knowledge there. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'd like to know what plant is that? Oh, it's a happy plant with hands. <laughs> hey. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Rilke was amazing. Oh, I love that guy. Hey. hey, remember, this is it. We're getting close to ending, and you will be going home soon. Yeah, yes, my friend? OK. <laughs> Do you notice how his posture changed? <laughs> is that yeah, oh, sure, go ahead. <laughs> you are the college. You are the college. What is your ecosystem? My ecological function? Your ecological function is to seed us with wild ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And let those ideas percolate, insinuate, permeate us through our hearing, through our mind, and then, of course, open our heart right. so that we can be in the world in a really rich way. And, and spread those seeds. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> You've done that so well, so beautifully. Thank and you, Stephanie. Here, as you know, from the beginning of the college with Satish, and I've witnessed many great teachers, and your teaching has been really fabulous. You've integrated so many things that needed to be integrated. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, does, it seems right that after 25 years, when the college has reached its maturity, mm -hmm. that you come mm -hmm. and put together that maturity and articulate it so beautifully for all of us. Oh, thank you, Stan. Yeah. So thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you.
share one last story with you. Okay, so a long time ago, I've, I knew that I was supposed to be a writer from when I was a teenager. So when I was um, 19 or 20, right around in there, I went to an old thrift store junk shop and I found an old upright portable typewriter and a book on how to touch type. And I taught myself to type and I got really good at it and then realized I had nothing to say. <laughs> And unlike most writers, I listened to what I knew, right? And so I went a long time, but I, it's scary to write because to really do it, to really do it, you have to become naked inside the work, right? And it's difficult. As Barry Lopez said once, if you're not terrified when you're writing, you're doing it wrong. Okay. So, I snuck up on writing. I decided to sell rare books and manuscripts. So, and I met this marvelous writer named John Dunning in Denver, Colorado. <coughs> and um, he was in a 10 year dry spell. And he had this rare bookstore, used bookstore. And uh, I just sort of got pulled into it. I, you know, I, I just thought one day it would just be marvelous to like, have books signed by the people that had meant a lot to me. And it sort of got keyed off. I went down to this used bookstore in Boulder, Colorado. This, this is where it really started. And I just was in the store. And I, almost against my will, I was sort of drawn to this kind of bookshelf that had unique stuff in it. And there was one book on there, and I pulled it out. It was called uh, I Sing the Body Electric by Ray Bradbury. And I pulled it out. And I looked at it, and he had signed it. And I touched the place he signed it. I could feel this thrill of energy go through me. And it's, he took you know, that, the title from something of Walt Whitman's, I sing the body electric. The bodies of those I love engirth me, and I engirth them. They will not let me go until I fill them, charge them with the charge of the soul. So anyway, uh, so I got, oh, this is great. And then I went down to another bookstore named Trident, and not uh, Trident, uh, Stage House too. And I found a book signed by H.G. Wells. I was like, oh, this is amazing, you know. So I just got pulled into that world, and I, I started collecting books, rare books and stuff. And then our business took a turn for the worse, so I had to become a rare bookseller. You know, and I found an original manuscript by Bram Stoker, typed with all of his little corrections. He used purple ink to, to correct them, you know. And just all kinds of marvelous things. <coughs> and I began hanging out with all these rare bookmen, including John Dunning. And we would go to rare book shows in like LA and stuff and set up our tables and sell <coughs> books. And just, it was a marvelous time. I mean, it was just marvelous. And so we were at dinner one night talking telling stories of the rare book trade. And John goes, ah, here's one. So I said, and everybody listens, you know. He's a great rack hunter, storyteller, you know. He goes, he goes, I was in LA. I was at so-and-so's shop. He goes, you know, one of the great old bookmen. You know, this is all before the internet, you have to understand. It was a different world then, right? So he goes, I was in so-and-so's shop. And he's one of the great old bookmen. And he's, you know, shock of white hair and everything. And so he's in his shop one day. Here's a car pull up out front and the door open and close of the door of the car. And then the door to his shop opens and the little bell tinkles. And this really incredibly old man walks in. And he stands a minute, you know, sort of blinking, letting his eyes get used to the gloom of the shop. And then he sees the old bookman behind his counter. And he walks over and he goes, excuse me. I'm wondering if you could help me. 
And the old bookman says, uh, well, yeah, what, what can I do for you? And he says, well, there's a book I'm looking for. I haven't read it in a long time. You know, my mother used to read it to me when I was small. You know, and I'm getting close to the end now. And I'd just like to read it one more time, if I could. And so the guy says, well, all right, what book is it? And so the old gentleman tells him, and he goes, oh, I know that book. You know, it's a little uncommon. It's not very expensive, but I don't, I don't have a copy <coughs> now. Would you like me to do a book search for you? And the old gentleman says, oh, yes, please. Now, this used to happen to me all the time when there was a book I was looking for. And I go into a bookstore and say, will you do a book search? I always had the image. I couldn't get rid of it. There was like a fleet of little cars out behind the bookstore <laughs> with little drivers in suits. And he'd say, yo, order up. And he'd say, we need this book. And they'd scatter out over America looking for my book, right? I couldn't believe it took them so long all the time to find them. But anyway, actually back then what really happened was that you write your name and address down, which the old gentleman did, and it gets thrown in a drawer. And then when there's enough of them, what would happen is the bookstore owner would take out an ad in this magazine called A.B. Bookman's, and it would be stuff saying, you know, these are the books we're looking for. And then, you know, used bookstores and rare book guys all around the country would subscribe to that. And then when they had the slow day, they'd look through it, and then they'd, <coughs> if they had one, they'd send a little postcard saying, I have it. So, you know, so bookstore owners would get this magazine, some collectors, and a few book scouts. So a month or so goes by, and then you know the ad's out there, and the, the guy gets this postcard from Iowa or someplace going, uh, uh, yeah, we got a copy of your book. It's this you know, book scout that had found it. Now, the thing is, when John Dunning's telling the story and he brings up book scouts, we all nod knowingly, because all of us know book scouts. They're the only known form of life. <laughs> They can survive a direct nuclear attack besides cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> they're quite often marginal people, and they're walking along the street one day, and there's a garage sale, and it says hardback books, 50 cents each. They have $3. They buy six of them. They take it down to the used bookstore, and they get $12. They're hooked for life. <laughs> And some of these guys really get good at it, you know. They find these incredibly rare books sometimes, you know. Salem's Lot by Stephen King in the first issue, Dust Jacket, only 15 known copies, $35,000, right? Or a sign, Gone with the Wind, something like that. But most of the time, it's $3 into $12, right? So this book scout had sent this grubby postcard saying, yeah, I got a copy of this book. So the old uh, book, bookman calls the guy up and says, we've managed to locate a copy of the book you were looking for. It, this is how much it'll be. Do you want me to order it? And the old man goes, oh, yes, please. So the guy sends off the money, and you know, a couple weeks later, the book shows up. So he calls the old man and says, your book is here. So the old guy says, I'll be right over. So the old bookman has a great sense of style. So he, he cleans off the glass countertop and he sets the book right there in the middle waiting. And a little while later, here's the car up out front. The bell of the shop, the door opens of the shop, the bell tinkles, the old man comes in and once again stands there for a minute getting used to the gloom of the shop. And then he starts walking over and then he looks down and he sees the book and he just stops and his eyes kind of get a bit moist and everything and he walks over and with trembling hands he picks it up and he goes, oh, Oh my. And he opens it up, and on the first page is his mother's name. <gasps> There's that feeling again. In the <laughs> See, true story. So, for me, every time I go into the wildness of the world, it's like opening the book and finding my true mother's name. Okay. We can do that every day of our lives. And I really encourage you to do that. To never let anybody convince you that your feelings are wrong. Okay. To remain true to yourself, 
to go into the world and read that book every day. Because that feeling that was just in the room, you can have that feeling every day for the rest of your life. We have been riding. We have felt the swaying of the elephant's shoulders. And now, you want to climb on a jackass? <laughs> Try to be serious. Thank you. Thanks very much.